Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you all for coming. What an incredible venue it is. Um, I've been thinking back, uh, like Simon said, it's been five years ago that we got appointed uh, digital champions. Um, and you must have all heard it many, many times before, but uh, in those five years, much has changed. So when we set out to thinking what it would be to, to be digital champions, um, to champion this program, to help support it, to help develop it, uh, we didn't quite expect everybody to be sitting at home and everybody to be sitting on Zoom. And guess what? We're digital. So in many ways, we were at the forefront of how that whole innovation process happened. Um, so it's been quite an interesting couple of five years. It's been uh, a tremendously exciting journey. And then reflecting back on that, uh, again, and I'll, I'll move on in a minute to, to what we've achieved. But when we set out, um, in my mind, I did set out a set of objectives as to what I was hoping to achieve with this program. Um, and to me, there was a number of things that were very clear. One of them was this concept of digital environment. When we first did a uh, citizen science thing and we said, what do you think about the digital environment? They either pointed at their phones or they looked at computers or they started talking about the internet. Uh, but there was no environmental component in that. For them, digital environment was the environment in which digital <coughs> happens, right? And so one of the things that uh, we put forward clearly, and I'll show that in a minute in the slide, is this idea of that actually digital place within an environmental context is very powerful. And it is actually a concept, a concept that is worth pursuing in and its own right. Um, and that was the first challenge we had really, is to kind of put digital on the map. And with that, um, understanding and making clear what NERC's capabilities were around digital which are extraordinary. I mean, the amount of stuff NERC does in a digital space goes all the way from submersives to satellites to large supercomputers, but all of it's invisible to the, um, to the common public. The next thing was clear to me, and has been clear very long, so my, my background is in modeling. Um, I'm a statistician and a modeler, and I've noticed that in my particular community, everybody sticks to their discipline. So you have atmospheric modelers, oceanographic modelers, soil modelers, biodiversity people, ecological modelers, and everybody kind of talks to their own community and sits in their own community. And NERC very much is organized around similar type of pillars of discipline. So you had an environmental data center, an atmospheric data center, and an oceanographic data center. And none of these people were talking to one another much, um, when in fact, they all faced the same challenges challenges around how do we acquire data about the environment. Our understanding and our bases, our databases of the environment is still sparse. Um, so how do we use sensor systems to get better information about what the environment is doing at this point in time? How do we take that data? How do we store it? How do we collate it? How do we organize it? How do we make that data accessible to the community? Um, and how do we signpost the data? Uh, one of the big challenges we found is that half the time, most of the academic community didn't even know where to find particular data sets. So are there ways we can use digital tools to help signpost data to make the data more accessible? The other challenge we found, of course, is that the modeling communities weren't talking to one another, and they themselves faced very similar problems. So breaking across and generating this, this sense of community, of people embarking on a similar challenge which is the best, what is the best, most cost-effective way to acquire information about the environment, and what it is, is the state it's at, and where it's heading. Um, how can we use that data to inform decision-making in a coherent way? How do we support decision-makers? That component became core to what is now constructing a digital environment. The second challenge, apologies, um, we found was that, in effect, um, digital was always in NERC in the background. Uh, there was quite a strong digital infrastructure. And one of the things that we, we brought together, and it was, it was not, not just me and Steve, but it was the entire NERC digital community, um, together with Simon and Anna, um, was around developing a clear strategic view of how digital would develop in NERC. Uh, one of our big wins was a strategic, um, was a strategy document, the NERC digital strategy, which is now implemented and is now being part and core of how NERC thinks about its environmental science offering. So bringing digital at the core of NERC science offering, thinking about how digital can enable 
can transform how we think about the environment, how we help make decisions about the environment, and how we, ex how we express and articulate what we do in the environment to the general public and to policymakers and decision makers. That was at the core, at the heart of the things that I was hoping to achieve at the end of the, the program. As always, with many things, there are ticks and some, there are half ticks and others, and some things we didn't, that's, that's the, the way things go. Um, but I, I do think, and again, I'll go to slides for a minute, the, the key looking back, one of the, the key elements that I feel we really, really achieved, Steve and I, was this ability to unlock digital at the heart of NERC, now the heart of NERC science, and from there, also kind of showing how you can use digital tools to bring a community together uh, in very innovative ways, things like hackathons and digital trails, things that don't normally sit within the core NERC science. So the next slide, the reason why I started with this very long preamble, and I'm sorry, is that the next slide kind of shows our achievements. So I wanted to first set out what we were hoping to do and then move on to what we've achieved. So uh, as Simon indicated, we've had 10 million pounds committed to champions, myself and, and Steve, and 23 projects funded. That's quite a lot of projects that we managed to get through the door for 10 million pounds. Uh, we had 32 institutions involved and 45 project partners, so our impact was wide. Um, we have at least 26 digital technologies used. Um, if you've got any questions about which digital technologies, I'm going to point to Steve. Um, we had a, a large number of workshops and conferences, a huge online presence, um, as Abby well knows. Uh, we had 80 expert members. So in essence, we built an expert network, um, and that expert network was digital. It was mostly online, only towards the end of the program were we able to bring them together. And through that, we had a community, and that community spanned all the way from people that were very busy with sensor development, uh, how do I put a salinity sensor on a submersible to go into the ocean, to people uh, that sit on the uh, ethics side, that sit on the legal side, uh, you know, what is the legality of data? How does one use data? Who owns the IP? How does the IP get transferred? Um, those kind of ethical considerations, the use of the data, its utility, and how that then gets uh, applied environmental decision making was as much a dis discussion point as what is a digital twin and how does a digital twin function. And that's part of the strength of this program was we had these communities speaking to, the, to each other and we have these communities present in the room right now. So certainly, you know, invite you to speak to, to members of the expert network. Can we have a hands as who is here from the expert network? A couple. So please do talk to them. Uh, they can share your experiences as, as how they worked. We had a previous discussion about what multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary is and how it functions. This was multidisciplinary. It did, we did have people from very different disciplines talking to one another. Um, we did four digital trails. I'll spend a little bit more time in a minute, but that was very much around finding digital tools to signpost environmentally important data sets. So where someone somewhere has made a measurement, has deposited that data in one of the environmental depository, data depository stores, how do you get other people to find it and use it? Um, we had a very successful curated webinar series. I'll spend a little bit more time with that. Uh, we spent some time doing horizon scanning. Um, where is digital going and what does the future in digital look like for the environment? Um, and we have a very active Slack channel. On these, 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 these uh, vignettes kind of give a, a flavor of the various activities we've had. So here's the CDE uh, program overview. Uh, as you can see, we were appointed in 2018. Um, and that's a very young me there, I do recognize that. <laughs> I've aged since for a variety of reasons. Um, and of course in the middle of there was COVID um, and, and the impact of COVID. Um, despite that, we've had a whole series of very, very uh, active periods. Um, we, wave one was a set of feasibility studies uh, that were funded. Uh, wave two was another set of feasibility studies that led to the demonstrator projects 
Uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And later on in the program, we have representatives from the demonstrator projects speaking to you about what they've done and what they've achieved. And in the back, uh, we actually have them demonstrating what they did. Um, and then in the end, we had a, a, a funding of mini demonstrators. These were, the mini demonstrators were a result of all the discussion we had in the expert network of interesting ideas that came from that, and we were able to fund a number of that. And the one you're seeing there is, the, uh, is, is an art AI combination uh, around butterflies done by, and again, uh, we'll, you'll hear more about that as the day goes on. And then we had a whole set of uh, uh, conferences and, and various other activities as you would expect from a program like this. So what do we mean with digital environment? What is the, what's the concept of digital environment? There's two ways of seeing this. Uh, one is what I call the ARC, where you start with the data gathering exercise, um, the, the development of the sensors, the, the, how you get information, then you store that information, how do you access it, how do you maintain it, the metadata, the structure around that, how do you turn that data into information, so how do you make it informative, and then finally how do you use that information to make decisions about how we manage and how we understand our environment. The problem with an arc, of course, is that it goes from one to another. It's linear, and your point's well made. It's circular. And so this represents that same idea, but in a circular sense, that, of course, the sensor development will be as a function of where we need to make decisions. We're not going to put sensors in places we're not interested in. So you end up with this kind of circular process. And then, of course, all the buzzwords on the side represent kind of the scope, the sense of what we were trying to achieve with digital environment, things like uh, the various forms of sensor development, um, the computing, edge computing, cloud computing, um, and, and the various computing capabilities that UKRI have with that. Um, and then moving from that, how you get to things like analysis-ready data, data labs, how can you make that data quickly accessible to the research community uh, to then move quickly into uh, making decisions. Something, and this is my personal opinion here, something I've noticed a lot is we tend to repeat the data acquisition process a lot. The standard research program starts with, we're gonna go collect some data, then after we've collected some data, we're gonna go talk to the modelers, and the modelers are gonna do some things with it, and then we're gonna go talk to the decision makers and say, look, our pretty model does this. And that's a standard research program. And actually, if you think about how often we collect data about the same thing over and over and over again, when in fact, we've got massive data repositories of people who have collected that data before, but this data needs to be accessible. And that's one of the, the, the work we did around that use of structured and unstructured data. The idea uh, that came out of Lancaster around uh, virtual labs uh, and this idea of analysis-ready data, data that is, can be immediately ingested through an API, can be used quickly uh, for the, by the community to, to develop that on. And in many ways, that's a massive efficiency. And, Going back to the earlier point, we go to Treasury and we make a case. The next spending review, we need funding for this. We can go to Treasury and say, actually, there's been a previous massive investment of X amount of pounds in this data set, in these data systems, in all these structures, and we need add-on investment to make that investment work for you. You've got a case with Treasury. And that's the other thing around these, making these data sets available. And then you move into the space that, that I get excited about as a modeler and statistician, which is the digital twinning space. And the, you know, the, how do you turn all of this into something informative? The key to all of this is to keep the decision makers front and central. That what we're doing is meaningful, and what we're doing actually helps us manage the environment better and helps inform decision makers better. Um, and one of the things I personally really, really enjoyed uh, from doing an SPF is we worked closely with DEFRA. There was this clear component of government interest in what we were doing and how this related to government decision making. Um, so we had a clear input from, you get, in our side, from DEFRA, um, and that, def, that component, you could see that come through in many of the decisions we made as an SPF. Um, having been involved in many other of these big strategic funding programs, that having that key stakeholder governmental con contact was key to making this successful uh, and informative. So in terms of the feasibility studies, um, this gives you a, a flavor 
Uh, again, uh, there's a website, uh, digitalenvironment.org, which has far more detail on what each one of these does. Um, but we have, in essence, uh, we, we funded a hub for greenhouse data, uh, greenhouse, sorry, a hub for UK greenhouse gas data, HUGS, um, and I can see Neil sitting in the back there, uh, who's part of the HUGS story. Um, engineering and transforming integrating sensor networks and train the dynamic movement uh, motion map of the UK, which was with Bristol. Then feasibility two, uh, we went into water resources, a digital environment for water resources from Glasgow. Uh, mitigation, landscape mitigation informatics uh, against landscape geohazards. Um, underwater large area resolution monitoring for distributed optical fiber acoustic sensors, University of Southampton. And sounding out a river, a new system for monitoring riverbed load mobilization and transport. These were our moving rocks um, from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and a number of other ones, mosaic, uh, moisture sensors, uh, so mo uh, combining cosmos with uh, measurements, uh, meteorological and landscape virtual labs. So here we're starting to move to this concept of virtual labs, and the virtual labs are what sits ab uh, above our data structures, allowing us to quickly analyze data um, from Lancaster University. So all these various feasibilities led to what was then our demonstrator call. The idea was basically, instead of having a, a bunch of research projects, we would have a set of feasibility uh, projects where we tried and trialed different types of technology. Um, but it, as you can see, there is already decision-making and end-user components, even in the feasibility component. Um, and I'll talk about the demonstrator call in a bit. We also had, we then led on to a demonstrator call workshop in 2019. We had a number of them across the UK, Cardiff, London, and Edinburgh. I was, I was present at the Edinburgh one. Um, you can see a very young Simon there, <laughs> what COVID does to us. <laughs> um, and in effect, we had a lot of these, um, they were well attended. Um, and we were really were we were really building a, a community around them. COVID hit, and the whole thing had to go online, um, which which functioned well at the end. In terms of the demonstrator projects, um, approximately each one of them was about a million pounds. They lasted uh, 24 uh, month uh, months in duration each. Um, and I'm just going to read the titles because we are actually have representatives from the demonstrator projects uh, following on this session. And. They have stands in the back and in the next room over where you can actually see what they've done and you can interact with some of the technology they've developed. So Cream Tea, which is probably one of the best titles I have ever seen of a research program. Mm -hmm. I really like it. Uh, Coastal Resilience Alerts and Monitoring Technologies. So this is very much around wave and wave action um, as, it, as it breaks over the edge. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the nicest slides you always see is the train comes across and gets hit by a wave. Decide, delivering, uh, enhanced eco uh, delivering enhanced biodiversity information with adaptation, citizen science, and intelligent digital engagements. Sensum, uh, smart sensing of landscapes, under, uh, undergoing hazards and hydrological movement. Uh, pyramid, platform for dynamic hyper-resolution, uh, hyper near real-time flood risk assessment, integrating re repurposed and novel data sources. Sentinel, which is uh, treescapes and OpenGHG, which was a, a follow-on from the feasibility study uh, around greenhouse gases, um, and Retina, dynamic monitoring and reporting and verification of implementing negative emission strategies in managed ecosystems. Now, one of the things I hope, as we've gone through this, that you see the flavor and nature and breadth of projects we've had. These are cross-disciplinary. We've had projects in most of the biospheres using uh, a myriad of technology. Um, and this kind of, to me, addresses the first challenge I had. How do we make sure that this isn't discipline-based, that this isn't a particular discipline putting their research ideas forward? Um, and to me, the, the, the concept, the structure of a feasibility leading to a demonstrator addresses your point around challenge-led. Um, and if you do things from a challenge-led perspective, very quickly you are in that multidisciplinary world. You're not worried about anymore if you're an ecologist or a hydrologist. You're worried about a system and how do we understand, monitor, and better manage that system. Um, I've, I've, we did quite a lot of work around community engagement. We had um, a public engagement uh, process early on 
and then later we had uh, a set of, of we called them dig uh, digital gatherings, which sounds a bit oxymoronic, but we actually were there physically, but it was digital gatherings. Um, and there's a, the, the first conference we had post-COVID, which was at Birmingham in 2022. And then uh, the last conference we had as a community was at Bass in 2023, just now. Uh, and both, both an incredible success, uh, nice, nice buzz, uh, people really engaged. Um, we, being digital, of course, part of our, our remit was to start using novel and different digital tools to engage the community and to engage the public. And one of, them, uh, one of the key ones is hackathons. And one of the things we did a lot was how do we make NERC data available to the digital community to then propose or develop some hackathons around that. Um, and we had a set of challenges around that. So we had the COVID-19 uh, digital sprint hackathon. That was massively successful. How does environmental data help our response to COVID? And some really interesting uh, responses to that, designing trains and understanding the importance of green space, but all based on NERC data. Um, and then we recently had uh, another set of hackathons in 2023. Um, again, very successful. And the neat thing about hackathons is you're making NERC data available to the entire NERC community. And you have people coming through that are not even part of NERC community, uh, computer scientists and whatnot, suddenly interested in using environmental data in novel and different ways. Um, and it's very cost effective. It's, you know, you're not funding a very large uh, science program. What you're saying is, here's some data. It's exciting data, but we're not so sure what to do with it. Let's run a hackathon, and at the end, uh, there's a set of prizes for the, the person that best develops a novel application, a novel way of thinking about that data. It's short, it's sharp, but it actually addresses people and communities that typically we wouldn't address within our, within our, within our NERC science community. And then our expert network, who were basically the backbone of the whole program. And thanks again to everybody here on the expert network. Um, we're hoping this, uh, in some way or other, may continue into the future. Um, but in any case, thank you so much for the support over the last five years. Uh, we've had a lot of people that have stayed with us for the past five, five years, and that's been really, really encouraging, um, as well as having quite uh, uh, novel people coming in, coming out all ages, uh, early career researchers, senior experts, international experts. We had a, quite an international community built around this. Um, and now we have an alumni system of 80 expert networks. This is a community that is interested in understanding digital tools, how to apply them, and how to build from them. Um, and a lot of the network members are now embedded in the digital strategy, uh, are part, and this is a bit boring, but if you're into IT and into data systems, you understand that governance is one of the key elements that always sits behind it. They're part of the governance structure. They're part now of that digital community that's supporting NERC and its science. Um, so in a way, it's, a, um, it's an added benefit. It's, it's a capability that NERC now has, uses, and has access to. And that's been an incredible success story. And again, highlighting inc the incredible cross-disciplinarity of the, you know, we're just seeing there's faces, but you know, there's biodiversity, there's ethics, there's law, uh, there's digital twinning, um, there's remote sensing. There, so in those faces, there is such a, a spread of expertise and knowledge uh, represented. The webinar series, uh, again, this, this, we always intended to do it, but it became one of the key delivery platforms during COVID because of a way to build the community and, and extend the community, but also for people to start communicating. So we have um, over, uh, if you can see just the Constructing Digital Environment, we have 278 subscribers, but we have over 83 videos, uh, webinar series of a whole variety of topics, going all the way from how do you worry about uncertainty and statistics to ethics, to law, to, um, to various applications, sensor development. So if you haven't seen our webinar series yet, I strongly encourage you, one, to subscribe, because we want that number to go up. <laughs> and two, um, you know, it's an incredible resource of, of, of know-how, of knowledge, of how to think about digital. And this, to me, was, became the key point around signposting. Signposting where data sets are, but also signposting knowledge, understanding, tools, 
this is a learning base where if you're embarking or starting on your digital journey, you're thinking about using digital tools to help resolve a particular problem, please, the experts are there. We've got 83 videos of people telling you what they've gone through and signposting best practices, signposting how one approaches a digital problem. And that's it for me, I think.